Hi everyone, uh, thanks so much for giving me the chance to explain a bit about the work that I'm currently doing with my PhD. Uh, I'm in the third year of my work over at the University of Edinburgh and today I'll be talking about the Cameroon volcanic line from geochemical perspectives. Um, so let's jump in. So I don't think the Cameroon volcanic line has been discussed yet at VMSG this year. Uh, it's quite an interesting province. Um, the magmatism in this area spans both oceanic and continental lithosphere, but this occurs at a passive margin, so we deem it intraplate in nature. It's about 1,600 kilometres uh, long, and um, Mount Cameroon, which is the most active volcano of the centre, is the second most active volcano in Africa at the moment. So, um, yeah, it's definitely still an active system that we should be thinking about. Um, in terms of intraplate magmatism, uh, the Cameroon volcanic line has some interesting features which we don't see in other places. Uh, namely, the magmatism in this area is not uh, time progressive, which is something that you'd expect given that the strike is so definite from the southwest to the northeast. So um, this plot to the right just shows the volcano's position and the age of onset of magmatism in the area. You can see that um, the most, uh, the youngest part of the line, uh, Itinde, which I've labelled there, is actually the um, in the centre of the line. So this is really not um, what we'd expect if the volcanoes were getting older and younger in one direction. Uh, as well as this, there are other observations which lead us to think that the situation might not be a simple mantle plume model in this area, such as uh, regular olivine um, temperature from thermobarometry uh, and conjugate magmatism in Brazil uh, on the other side of the Atlantic. So this is where my PhD comes in. Um, the goal of my work is to investigate a new model for intraplate magmatism, which invokes an enriched component in the mantle rather than a deep seated uh, mantle plume. So I'm combining lots of geochemical techniques and applying them to rocks from Atinde, which is a volcano with uh, quite extreme geochemistry at this line, which I'll go into a bit more later. Uh, on the right there is a map of where I've got samples from. And uh, sadly, I didn't get to go out there myself, though I do have other field work planned elsewhere. But Godfrey Fitton, who some of you might know, collected these rocks in many field campaigns in the 70s and 80s. So I've got quite a nice and dynamic sample suite. Uh, I've had to learn quite a lot about silica undersaturated rocks uh, throughout the start of my PhD, but I've got to grips with them now. So here is the, um, the suite of rocks that I'm studying from Atinde. Uh, the least evolved uh, contain olivine. Uh, but they're all nepheline normative and highly silica undersaturated. Uh, most of the suite from Atinde are intermediate metanephalonites, which means they contain titanorgite and nepheline as major funicus phases. And uh, the most evolved rocks are really interesting. They're called sholomite nephalonites because they contain this mineral called sholomite, which is similar to garnet. And they also contain leucite, melilite and nepheline. But uh, two key minerals that I want to draw your attention to if they haven't already stood out are Hawine and Nosium. So these are pretty much the same thing, uh, just that Nosium's a bit more evolved. I'll explain a bit more in a second. Uh, but Hawine really is that blue and plain polarised light. Uh, it's a really cool mineral to be working with. And I wanted to draw your attention to these because I'm going to present some work I've been doing on sulphur and chlorine today. And uh, sulphur is hosted as a major phase in Hawine. So just to expand a little bit more, uh, this is just the, I guess, phase diagram of sodalite group diacrophoids. <coughs> And uh, Howin is the calcic end member, whereas Nosian is the sodic end member. And on the graphs that I'll show you in the upcoming slides, I've colour coded rocks which contain Howin as blue and rocks which contain Nosian as red. So, just to uh, give you a bit of a taster of just how wacky Atende is as a volcano, here are some of the uh, two plots that I wanted to show you. There's not too many more graphs in my talk. Uh, but Atende is highly enriched in volatiles and incompatible trace elements. Uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, it means that I've got strontium contents of over 5,000 ppm. Um, this is whole rock data. And the strontium is so high that Godfrey actually defined a whole new mineral called strontium metalite um, a few tens of years ago. Um, but yeah, these rocks are really interesting. And then um, I'm doing a whole host of other work, which I'm not presenting today, uh, which talks a bit about halogens uh, and sulfur contents. But um, you can see here that they're really uh, also quite enriched in, in the volatiles. OK, so I'm now going to delve a bit into sulphur isotope work, which I've been doing, and I'm not sure how much people will be familiar with it. So I'll just explain Delta 34S as a concept. 
It's where we take the 34 isotopolog of sulfur relative to the 32 isotopolog of sulfur in a sample and compare it to an agreed upon standard, uh, which is the Canyon Diablo Troy. Uh, and then we can use this to almost fingerprint where volatiles in the system uh, may have come from or where the sulfurs come from, which can be a proxy for other volatile enrichments. So that was the goal. I thought if I could measure the delta 34s composition of some of these atinde nephilimites, it might give me uh, an insight into where the sulfurs come from in the system, which I can then use to um, to develop my understanding of where this enrichment's come at atinde and whether it might be related to uh, this enriched flow of component at the Cameroon volcanic line overall. And um, delta 34s, uh, yeah, is really useful. So the agreed upon value for the mantle is about zero. Uh, I've shown the typical range in some different um, common igneous reservoirs there, but I've also included seawater. And this is because I use seawater as a proxy for the delta 30 fresh composition of an evaporitic deposit uh, later on when I'm modeling some assimilation processes. My data is shown uh, in the blue bar, and these are um, data which I collected at CERC in East Kilbride, just near Glasgow. And uh, they're interesting in two ways. I wasn't really sure if the sulfur ice chips would work because it was something that I just Kind of developed and my supervisors weren't sure about either um, but it, it's showing two interesting things which i'm still working on so the first thing is that the atinde nephilites sit um well outside error the error is about 0.2 per mil on these data above uh, the ambient mantle does 34 s of zero uh, telling me that something's going on and then also there's a widespread within my data they range from about 3.9 to 8.1 per mil uh, and this is something that I wasn't quite expecting and thought it might be able to give me some insight into more depth about what's happening in the massic system at Atende, uh, which I'll go into now. Um, you can see here in this graph that um, when we examine how the delta 34s composition of the rocks are varying, uh, they kind of coincide with evolution within the system. So that's why I pointed out the Howian and the Nosium before. As we go from the more uh, howian rich rocks, which contain calcium, up through to the nosium suite, which contains sodium, the delta 34s tends to get more positive, uh, which is a nice constraint as it tells me that this is some kind of process that's coincident with evolution. So first I modelled uh, the idea that I could be assimilating a highly positive delta 34s composition component into my magma, which is driving the compositions towards more positive values. And this has been invoked in other places. So this is just how it might look. Uh, evaporitic deposits haven't been studied extensively in Cameroon, but not much geology really has in this area and it, they could exist because there are a lot of um, interesting deposits around the area. Um, so this is just a simple model of one of the assimilation uh, curves which I plotted. The assimilant shown with the, the star on the upper right there. Um, I chose quite a non-extreme assimilant value just to see if anything would work as none of the assimilation models were working and we really thought this might be quite a viable process to explain the data but it just so happens that it's probably not what's going on and that the sulfur and the delta 34 s aren't really coincident with some kind of cross or assimilation process. So then I turned to degassing and the loss of sulfur bearing gases is one way in which we can drive delta 30 s compositions to become more positive as the gas phase preferentially removes the 32 isotopolog. And forgive me that this plot might be a little bit complicated, but um, in order for a magma to crystallize these sodium like liquid feldspathoids, it's probably in the temperature range of 800 to 1150 degrees Celsius, which are the parameters that I've input to the degassing models which I've developed on this plot. I've used a nickel nickel oxide oxygen fugacity buffer of 0 0.85 to 1.4. Um, and you can see that degassing maybe goes some way to explain some of the variation that I'm seeing, particularly with some of the howling burning rocks. Um, I've been in conversation with some people who know a bit more about sulfur isotopes up at St Andrews and are hoping to uh, measure a couple more data points because we're unsure whether degassing is totally plausible in the situation, but it's something that I'm really developing with other people. Um, so hopefully this will be a work in progress before I have seen. Then on to that second question, uh, does the fact that the Atinde nephilimite sits higher than delta 30 for S of zero tell us that there might be something else going on with where the sulfur is coming from? And a delta 30 for S higher than zero is something that we would associate with a metasomatic or recycle component uh, if we can unpick other processes which can push it to more positive values. So that's where my thinking is at at the moment. 
Uh, my data aren't necessarily contradicting the idea that the sulfur might be metasomatic in origin, which would fit nicely with our new model for how uh, Cameroon volcanic line magnetism might be occurring, though it's not totally constrained yet, namely because I haven't managed to measure the delta 30 for us of the most primitive rocks in the olivine bearing suite, as this was uh, limited at CERC. Though I think in St Andrews, hopefully it will be possible to do this, and I've got a lab work planned for 10 days time. I'm right in the middle of my PhD, so I'm combining these uh, kind of investigations into metasomatism with other work, um, measuring the chemistry of olivines, uh, looking to integrate a halogen data set which I've collected for all of the rocks from the suite, as well as trace elements from my CBMS. And I've got some time to do in situ SIMS work, uh, looking at perovskite communicrists, which can hopefully explain the partitioning behaviour of some of the incompatible trace elements, which are behaving in quite unique ways at this volcano. And I've also got some argon argon dates coming back for the volcano. But um, in summary, hopefully you stuck with me for the sulfur ice uh, The key points are really that Atinde lavas are really enriched in volatiles and incompatible trace elements, and that we're not quite sure why this has happened yet. Uh, sulfur ice are a useful tool as they can fingerprint where magmatic volatiles may have come from. The unusual geochemistry is unlikely to be associated with assimilation, which is something that we were really keen to investigate. Uh, but the significance of degassing and the metasomatic origin of sulphur are things I'm hoping to elucidate with some lab work in St Andrews. So uh, I'll take any questions now. <laughs>